Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, Jaron, I'm in control. I'm in control. But even though you're in control, are you good? You good? Jaron, Jaron, I'm good. I'm good. I'm very good now. now. Good to hear, Matt. Good to hear. Uh, another week, we Matt, we made it once again. We made it. We made I know, it. with uh, Father Time constantly kicking us down, uh, mm-hmm. it, it's good to reconnect on a weekly basis just to make sure that we're both good, mm-hmm. even though on a daily basis, I send you the most... <laughs> Matt, uh-huh. I feel like our actual discord chat conversation dm space mm-hmm. is a lot of clips of hololive mm-hmm. um matt and a uh-huh. lot of <laughs> potentially encouraging each other to purchase things <laughs> because matt uh-huh. if there is one thing that makes me feel good about me buying something it's knowing my pals are also buying something that hmm I'm an enabler and, you know, ask our friend Mark, uh, Saturday morning arcade uh, original. Um, every time he looks me something, Matt, you, you know, I'm I'm the devil on both the shoulders oh, when it comes to purchases. So, Matt, mm-hmm. weekly consumerism check, because mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. all we do is consume. <laughs> uh, have you heard Wallet Coon recently? Jen, Wallet Coon. Wallet Coon t- took a, a slight hit this week, a much uh, okay. softer hit than it, I was expecting. But you know, it was a it was a, it was a it was a tap in terms of you know how poorly we spend money. Fair, fair enough. Matt, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. what uh, what did you bring into the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse this week? So, Jaren, over like I think since the last time we um talked, Jaren, Father Time had hit my mouse, and Jaren. My mouse was going through a very long struggle with uh, Father Time, and it finally kicked the bucket last week to the point where editing last episode, Jern, was a horrible, horrible nightmare. <laughs> oh, my, my apologies, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Matt, really thank you for editing uh, the podcast. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, to know that there was pain and suffering involved, Matt, mm-hmm. double mm-hmm. thank. Matt, mm-hmm. one thanks now, and then another thanks at the end of the oh, episode. Man. Jern, Matt? My, my good old Logitech G600 was you know getting the the classic double clicks the the no clicks the um not letting go of a drag when you let go of the drag it was it it, it was making it really really rough and jaren i i wanted to go buy a new one but unfortunately i'm very very surprised to learn that logitech stopped making the g600 and didn't you know make a newer equivalent mouse and for for those that don't know know, the logitech g600 is a mmo style mouse so it's like one of those mouses that have like the 12 buttons on like your thumb side of the mouse yes and jared when i was looking at it on um amazon the resell the like price of it uh usually that mouse is like in like the 45 55 range the resales were going for like ninety dollars, and I didn't really want to pay that much for a like resold mouse. So I looked into Jaren, the I guess the other place that really really only makes a uh, MMO mouses, and it was the kind of like the razor side of things, Jaren. And Jaren, razor mice are so expensive. Yep. Yep. Oh man, Jaren, the the Naga V two is like a hundred and twenty three dollars. <laughs> Did you do it, Matt? Did you do it? I, I didn't really want to go that deep. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, Jaren, I ended up just going. I kind of ended up doing kind of some like uh, researches online on, in 2024, what is like the best like price point equivalent and functionality equivalent of the Logitech G600. And I ended up getting the Red Dragon M908, which, okay. Jaren, honestly, basically the same. I... I kind of really like the software for this as well. It is, I think, a lot functionally. It is a lot better than the, um, I think, the Logitech G Hub. But Jaren, this 
the design of this software is really like I want to say like 2007 gamer. Amazing. Where it's you know <laughs> very edgy. There's a lot of red everywhere, which I guess make makes sense with since their company name is like Red Dragon, but it looks like in like a Winamp skin. <laughs> Incredible, Matt. That, that's all you needed to tell me to sell me on a Red Dragon product. Oh, man. But, Jaren, it, it, the mouse is going good so far. I, I like it. It is a a kind of big mouse, Jaren. I, I know a lot of people don't like big mice, and it I left all the um weights inside of it because I like heavy mice. So Same. Mm-hmm. This is this is working very well for me, Jaren. I think the only thing I really miss from either the kind of like Naga or the uh, Logitech G600 side is that... Those had the kind of rocker mouse wheels. Right. You can, like, click the mouse wheel itself to the left or the right for, like, you know, just as extra buttons. And this one not having that is a little bit of a disappointment. But, you know, overall, this this mouse is is pretty good. Okay. I know mouse-wise, I forget which Corsair I'm rocking. But I, too, kept the weights in my mouse as well Mm -hmm. to the point where um, I know essentially my home setup and my in office setup were the same, you know, same Corsair mouse, um, same Poker Two mechanical keyboard, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of my coworkers were really surprised at how heavy my mouse was. But Matt, I don't know, I just prefer <laughs> a really heavy mouse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have to ask you, Matt, mm-hmm. does it pass the gamer LED light test? Yeah, Jaren, there's so many lights on this. I had to like, nice. Jaren, this thing got so bright that I had to turn it to lowest brightness for it to not hurt my eyes. <laughs> Man, Matt, Mm -hmm. in terms of your current setup right now, how much LED light vomit is coming uh, is coming out of it? Um, my mouse, you know, is just I have my mouse on a solid breathing kind of like deep purple, and then my keyboard itself LEDs are just you know a cascading rainbow, (laughs) and whenever you you press a button, it like you know does like a ripple effect out. (laughs) I know with my current setup, my RAM is glowing, you know, that Mm. ever-changing rainbow vomit of lights Mm -hmm. where I'm just too lazy to go into the BIOS to turn that off, Matt. Mm -hmm. But it's so (laughs) disgusting, I feel, (laughs) but Uh I'm also kind of used to it. But it also makes me feel bad that it's just running essentially 24-7, so I should probably turn that off as well. But Matt, Mm -hmm. speaking about Father Time... You know, coming for all our hardware. Unfortunately, Matt, my Sony over-the-ear Bluetooth headphones. I know. Um, you know, it's that time, Matt, where the faux leather starts to unravel, and then you see all the sponges in. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the ear cuffs or whatever. But Matt, mm-hmm. this this headset lasted me a while. Mm-hmm. I think five years. This was a pre-pandemic Ooh. purchase. Damn. So. And just now, the leather is starting to unravel. Matt, want to know why the leather started unraveling? Why, Jaren? Started working out with these uh, <laughs> headphones know. after so long. And surprise, sweat and headphones still don't mm-hmm. <laughs> mix, Matt. And I'm kind of in the market for uh, a new over-the-ear, you know, just had Bluetooth headset. Just something that I can wear when walking my dog, a.k.a. to make everyone, to for me to... Not acknowledge anyone trying to talk to me, but also put myself in danger when cars <laughs> are turning. But mm-hmm. I don't know, Matt. It's my sick and twisted brain where I bought these Sony headphones, you know, pre-pandemic on sale. I think it was around Boxing Day for it ended up being 140 after tax. And Matt, Damn. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to be able to find a decent pair of over the ears uh for that price in 2024 i possibly could but i still need to do some research right now but Mm -hmm. i know there's not that i'm gonna buy into them just because they're so expensive but i like the concept of those you know those airpod maxes or airpod pros i'm not sure what they're at code the over the ear airpods and the fact that you're able to just actively um replace the head or you know that your cups or whatever mm-hmm. and that 
Mm-hmm. I want to find an alternative that will let me just buy new ear cups for my headset. But mm. that's currently what I'm looking for right now. Uh, other than the graded Hololive cards, I keep linking to you, Matt. But maybe <laughs> uh-huh. that's a story for next week. But I mean, Jared, I'm surprised like you use over ear headphones on when you're like moving around because I always found that hard to keep balanced on my head. Matt, I'm pretty sure there's like an indent in my head, <laughs> like a, a subtle indent from years, aka decades now, mm-hmm. of heavy over the ear headphones where i think it's just something i'm used to Mm. i do have them you know tight enough that the balance pretty appropriately Uh, i see and i I think for me it's i don't know if it's placebo at this point but you know me matt i I like me good bass Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for a headphone and any in earbud that i've tried you know recently aka in the past few years Mm -hmm. i don't get that same base but again maybe this is something i need to do more research on like you with you trying to purchase a new mouse but Mm -hmm. uh, maybe i'll keep you posted matt on my audio (laughs) attempts uh or purchases in the near future but Mm -hmm. i miss Mm -hmm. prime day boxing day maybe labor day sales but it's so hard for me to fully commit to a big tech purchase like that mm-hmm. when I know ugh, maybe I should just wait till Boxing Day and struggle for the next, I don't know, what is it, uh, four months or so? Mm-hmm. Because Matt, mm-hmm. surprise, Father Time will <laughs> make sure that gets here sooner or later. I mean, but... Jaren, I'm sure there'll be some kind of like, you know, back to school sale that you can probably cash in on. Fair enough. Uh, and hopefully I can pretend to be a student, even mm-hmm. though that doesn't work these days, Matt. Mm-hmm. Jaren, Jaren, anybody of any age can be a student, Jaren. Fair enough. Matt, mm-hmm. if there's one thing Duolingo is <laughs> teaching me, <laughs> that is definitely the case. Matt, I, I should probably buy those uh, introductory to Japan, like elementary school books uh, that all the kids do, but that's also mm-hmm. something I need to do research on because that's probably a better use of my money than <laughs> that. Mm-hmm. Let's just say I was this close to going all in on a uh, SSR rainbow <laughs> uh, signature Muna card the other day. Oh, man. And that this would have been a very different podcast <laughs> if I fully committed. Jerry, you know, but... if you want to commit your money to that, I can I can send you some links to some pretty good uh, Japanese resources so you don't have to buy textbooks. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. But we'll, we'll save that for after the call. But for this call in particular, Matt, mm-hmm. I, I feel like we're obligated to discuss um, something that happened or at least something that we read this last week and Mm -hmm. that remember when we brought back the mistake zone uh this current iteration or at least season five yes and one of the topics we discussed was our girl nagatoro our boy Mm -hmm. senpai Mm -hmm. and i believe it was a a anime announcement but see another season later a couple of episodes and that we Mm -hmm. finally saw uh the conclusion of nagatoro and senpai's story um, Matt, mm-hmm. what did you think of the finale of Nagatoro? Jaren, I honestly was kind of surprised that Nagatoro ended. Yes. Because, you know, this whole kind of like art school and like judo kind of combination thing felt like a very weird arc to me overall. So I'm surprised that it was the last one. Where I know this was announced a few weeks ago when after the conclusion of the judo arc, after the conclusion of uh, Senpai's art school arc, Mm -hmm. we did get that note from the authors saying that, hey, a few more chapters until uh, the end of Nagatoro. Mm -hmm. And in terms of pacing, it does seem kind of weird where I'm of two minds of this, Matt. Mm -hmm. Where on one hand, I'm glad that they were able to explore some sort of conflict within their relationship, especially this early after being made official where, Mm -hmm. you know, 
senpai has to draw one of his classmates or you know his i forget her name but his rival character from the art school arc yeah and he draws her in the nude tries to hide it from nagatoro nagatoro you know goes into senpai stuff and reads it and that creates a conflict that is kind of solved within you know a chapter or two mm-hmm. and i was i'm kind of glad that we got to see some real conflict at it didn't drag on, but at the same time, it does. The ending does feel a bit abrupt, especially since we did see a pretty, not a time skip per se, but I feel like you still could have stretched this out if you wanted to, a few more chapters, uh, just to kind of explore different dynamics of them being an official couple now and how that Mm -hmm, relates mm -hmm. to all of the characters that we've seen in the past and just to see how that might play out. But for them to have one quick conflict and then go straight into graduation, it is, I don't know, Matt, you know me, I like me a good story that is pretty compact in a way, but at the same time, I feel Mm -hmm. like if your romance manga is already 150 chapters deep you can probably stretch it out a bit more but then again you do run into the issue of you not really being able to tell a story where i don't know matt how how are you feeling with the pacing and the chapters leading up into the finale yeah jaren i i thought the pacing of it was kind of for me, like, a little bit, like, kind of empty. I really felt like some chapters, I didn't really feel like anything happened. Or, right. like, the stuff that happened could have just been, you know, done in two pages of, like, the last chapter. I, and, I don't know. I I really wish that there was just, like, one more arc where right. it was a lot more, you know, just focused on Nagatoro and Senpai. Yeah, like you know, getting to either having gotten together at the start of the arc, or like you know, getting together somewhere in the middle, and like you said, like having everybody else kind of react to it. We're again, I think, as you said, one more arc that has something that really tests their relationship. I know it is a pretty easygoing manga at this point Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw such growth was from Senpai, from Nagatoro. But again, I feel like when you're building up a romance, at least story, in my opinion, for things that I want to see, part Mm -hmm. of the payoff is to see how everyone kind of reacts to it. And we don't necessarily get to see a lot of that within the Nagatoro supporting cast, which is kind of a shame. But at the same time, you do run the risk of, okay, now that your characters are together, what's the actual story you're trying to push? Because Matt, Mm -hmm. as much as I love uh, Hatami-chan is shy with strangers, now that, you know, her and Usa are together as well, there's like nothing really (laughs) happening in that manga. And... You know me, Matt, I love me some slice of life, but I kind of wished that there was a pretty much underlying narrative or storyline that they were pushing. And again, on one hand, I'm okay with Nagatoro ending um, and not really making it drag. But at the same time, I do think there's still some story that you can tell. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Regarding the final chapter, though, Matt, we have the graduation speeches from Nagatoro, who's the cla- the second year rep, and then you have Senpai's speech, who <laughs> is the graduating class rep. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. Um, good. And en- and then of course they're ending with the brief time skip. Senpai is in call or university. He comes back to visit. We see the new art club, and for all time's sake, uh, he gets to draw Nagatoro in the scene. Or at least the series comes to an end where that mm-hmm. final chapter wise, how are you feeling with <laughs> what was presented and how it is as a finale? Jaren, I think like as a overall kind of like finale, it was fine. But Jared, when I was reading those speeches, all I could think was, wow, what a self-centered like almost because I was kind of viewing it as like a the equivalent of like 
the valedictorian speech. Yeah. And I, I couldn't help but think, wow, this is such like a self-centered valedictorian speech instead of, like, you know, sending off like the general class sort of thing. I don't know if you felt that same way. <laughs> I think in terms of Nagatoro, it, it it's... I felt like that was so in character for Nagatoro at, like itself, where it was a fun speech of her, both her and Senpai, really juggling or walking that fine line between, hey, I want to tell my feelings or express my feelings to my significant other while still being respectful to the class, the graduating class as a whole, where mm. I think Nagatoro's speech about trying to what dreams you're trying to chase does seem kind of a bit uh self-centered at its core but at the same time i feel like she managed to save it quite a bit where in any real life scenario i think that it's pretty eye roll uh inducing just because she's kind of making it about her in a way but as a you know, something that you suspend your disbelief in. I think it was mm-hmm. pretty cute as well. Same with Senpais, which is also just a good kind of encompassing way to see how much he's grown as well, where it is true. The Senpai that we meet 150 chapters ago wouldn't be caught dead doing anything like that. And for him to also be selfish in a way, generally a character who we seem isn't, really that selfish uh i think it works well for what it was but i do agree that it is still pretty uh selfish of the both of them but hey mm-hmm. all their classmates and friends seem to think it was okay so that mm-hmm. my last uh questionable question mm-hmm. of our nagatoro discussion matt how do you feel about a romance manga or form of entertainment like this uh that doesn't end in a kiss do you think that was weird? Or do you think that the ending of Nagatoro asking Senpai to draw her quote unquote one more time or one last time is a better fit than uh, the kiss payoff? Did they not kiss in the manga? I thought they did. Like, in... No, they did, but not ending on the kiss, I mean. Oh, I think not ending on the kiss is fine. Like, I think what they did with um, kind of de- uh, Senpai drawing Nagatoro is, I think, yes. a very appropriate ending for... Uh this series yeah it's it's fair i i like i was fully expecting a kiss to be honest but you know just them mm-hmm. back in the club or the art club room nagator asking him to draw her one more time i don't it was a good send-off to me i i really appreciated it and overall i really did like nagatoro where again I think early Nagatoro overall is a really hard <laughs> recommendation <laughs> uh uh-huh. just because it is Nagatoro being a little shit. It's, it is her being relentless to Senpai and him not necessarily being able to defend himself just because that's his character. But mm-hmm. I think the payoff overall and just seeing both of them grow into, you know, more matured characters, even though there's still uh, Nagatoro's uh, Kusogaki energy. But at the same time, that just her being a bit more older, Senpai being a bit more you know selfish as well i think it was a good Uh run overall and uh, i don't know maybe maybe i'll go and try to collect all the chapters again i'm I'm still trying to collect uh hatomi and uh dress up darling though matt Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. matt Mm -hmm. speaking about manga i collect Uh wanted to talk about this real quick okay Earlier this week as well, or earlier last week, we did also see the new teaser for the Uzumaki anime um, coming to Adult Swim, I believe, late September. Matt, Mm -hmm. when it said that its airtime was like 12.30 p.m., that's, I don't know, that made me hype for some reason, just because growing up, uh, whether it be YTV for us or when I would visit my relatives in the States and then watch Adult Swim back then just whatever they were playing um post midnight was the anime hour and it was you know the dragon balls it was it, it's not an anime but w- what was that one show canadian show was it like cyber six or something like oh, that? oh man i have not thought about cyber six in a really <laughs> long time but that these grind it was that was really before the sailor moons before 
uh, the Pokemon. That was my introduction to more anime or more quote unquote adult animation without, you know, jumping into uh, hentai territory. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. seeing the Uzumaki teaser and seeing that it was going to debut like at 1230 on Adult Swim, Matt, that made me really happy. And so you mean 12 a.m., right? Yeah, 12 a.m., 12 yeah, a.m. Okay, a.m. okay. Uh, Matt, it's the coffee that's uh, <laughs> making my brain really weird right now. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the actual teaser itself, I think, Matt, I- I've talked about, you know, different uh, Junji Ito adaptations in the past. And I think this was the first time where I was legit shocked at how the animation quality was and how it really perfectly encaptures what uh, Junji Ito art is to me. Just mm-hmm. the black and white, the really distinct lines, and it looked great. Matt, it's really striking to me at how well it was adapted for the anime. And, you know, them going through all the different key storylines, seeing all the grotesque drawings, just hints at them at least. Uh, I'm really surprised that they're, it seems like they're really going for it really trying to present what, you know, monstrosities um, Junji Ito drew for this work, mm-hmm. where I'm, I'm really excited for it. But Matt, I know you watched the teaser just before you started recording. What were your initial thoughts uh, watching the teaser of Uzumaki? Jaren, I'm actually very, very glad that it is in black and white. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like it almost gets the creepiness across better than... Right kind of compared to um, the other adaptations of his that have been in, like, you know, proper color. Yes. Like, yeah, like, just having having that um, black and white art, like, really adds to it. Jaren, I'm... I was realizing as I was watching it that I really do not remember, like, the overall plot progression of uh, Uzumaki anymore. Like, I remember the, the main, main stuff, but a lot of these scenes were like, oh, man, I, I do not remember how they got here. <laughs> It, so, I recently read through all of Uzumaki again. Oh, just uh, to clarify. So, it's coming to Adult Swim or just the release, uh, September 28th. But, mm. so I read through all uh, the anthology that I have, again, just because I wanted to, like you, Matt, uh, really remember how this all comes together. And that... Mm-hmm. So, when I think about the the progression of the story i feel like uzumaki itself is so middle heavy in terms of its striking visuals where it is a so you know the quick synopsis of the story is you know it starts a uh, curie or curie uh and she lives in this town who as the story progresses, gets more and more obsessed with the idea of the spiral and ha- the different, you know, monstrosity forms that a spiral can take. Where it starts off pretty gradual, where I believe it's her boyfriend's dad who becomes obsessed with just the design of a spiral. And it sort of kind of progresses from there with a lot of people dying and it having to do and being cremated their ashes are spiraling in the sky and everything, you know, breaks loose from there. But Matt, Mm -hmm. I know in terms of Uzumaki, there's this one frame in particular, two frames actually, Mm -hmm. uh, or pieces of art that really sticks out. And one of them is from the heroine, um, Curie. And then it's her having her spot, her hair kind of spiral up the tip. And I, I think that's, the de facto image I think of when I think of Uzumaki. And that comes from the chapter called Medusa. And that, Mm -hmm. this whole segment of, you know, Uzumaki on the mistake zone is just me wanting to say, I think Medusa is probably the worst chapter (laughs) of the whole Uzumaki Uzumaki story. And it, it pains me just because it has some of the more striking visuals of the, of the whole story, but Matt, mm-hmm. the climax of this chapter is essentially her uh, fighting this girl who also wants to. So Kiri doesn't want attention. This 
other girl in her class wants that attention. And then it turns out their hair uh, is turning into spirals and they kind of have like a hair battle at some point. Uh-huh. And it's, I don't know, Matt, for something with with a lot of the key art pieces coming from this chapter in particular, when I got to Medusa again, I re- I remembered, man, this, this chapter sucked, <laughs> which is a pain. And then I think about rereading it i'm thinking about other chapters in particular and how grody they're gonna look when i mean we see glimpses Mm -hmm. throughout the teaser but you know seeing the snail chapter again in kind of animation will be horrifying Mm -hmm. Uh, mosquitoes mosquitoes and umbilical cord in particular i'm really curious to see how far they go with that because i'm not sure if you remember it matt but umbilical cord is a chapter that has to do with Curie's cousin, uh, who is pregnant, and what happens with her and her baby, where one of the final panels of that chapter is really graphic, where I'm not sure even if you can get away with that at 12.30 a.m. on Adult Swim. So I'm really curious Mm. to see how far they go with that scene in particular. But yeah, Matt, like it's still I'm really excited just to see how just it gets animated, but at the same time rereading through Uzumaki Matt, it it's still my same issue with a lot of Jonji Ito's work where I feel like the art is first and foremost what you go to this for, and the story itself is kind of uh, whatever at this point. Mm-hmm. But that's not going to stop me from buying the latest anthology. I believe it's Ali that I saw in the bookstore. So yeah, I'm I'm excited, Matt. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm-hmm. that's kind of what I've been up to this week in terms of things I've been reading. Matt, mm-hmm. have you read anything this week or just done anything this week uh, that's on your mind? Uh, Jaren, I have been kind of jamming on a Game Pass game uh, this oh. this past week. And, uh, Jaren, that game is Dungeons of Hinterberg. Matt? Uh-huh. This, the screenshots look pretty cool. I downloaded it as well. Didn't fire it up yet. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what is this game? Jaren, this is a, a kind of like a pretty interesting jumble of a kind of like series, uh, other series, I think, if I were to like kind of explain it. Because uh, this is primarily a life sim dungeon delving like vacation style game so something we would have pitched in saturday morning arcade season two jaren honestly i think this is a very saturday morning arcade season two type game because jaren in terms of um story the story of this is a uh, very kind of like stardew valley in that it is the main character kind of getting away from the hustle and bustle of her kind of lawyer life and traveling to, I think, Austria to go on vacation. And in this place in Austria, they have basically just, you know, kind of just MacGuffin the reason to say, hey, in this place, um, you can't, there's like, Some magical stuff has happened, like technology is on the fritz here, so you're going to be living a very simple life. Uh, There's no, like, internet or cell phones or anything. Um, Monsters show up here uh, sometimes that you have to, like, you know, fight. And there's dungeons that you can go into to, you know, adventure, find treasure, and that sort of thing. And then the dungeons themselves are all very, very puzzle-based. Um, honestly, the, the combat in this game is like, I think, or the, the puzzle to combat kind of like side of this game is like, I would say like 80% puzzles, 20% combat. And the combat itself is still actually like pretty like decent. I think it's like, it stands like on its own pretty well. I, I do like the combat once it opened up. I think like at the very start of the game, I thought the combat was a little bit too dry, but, uh, you know, they, they, they expanded later on, which I, I think I'll go into later. But, Jaren, I think the part that makes this very um, Saturday Morning Arcade Season 2 is that they incorporate basically S-Links into this game with uh, people that are around the kind of Hinterberg area that you can interact okay. with. Matt, mm-hmm. 
when you tell me there's Esslings with <laughs> different people or different NPCs around you, mm-hmm. you know, I immediately have to think, okay, what archetypes are we hitting with these different people? Matt, mm-hmm. who are you meeting on your adventures? Jaren, I've um, been... I can't remember the name of their what they actually call the S-linking in this game. So you're just going to keep saying S-linking. But I've been um, S-linking with this old man who's very interested in um, like researching why the magic is here. I've been uh, S-linking with these local kids who kind of like feel down that their hometown has become a, what do you call it? A um, kind of like tourist trap almost. Damn, that was pretty topical. <laughs> uh, I've been uh, ass linking with this kind of like not tour guide, but kind of like this guy who like shows you the ropes, and he's like very concerned down how like the world is becoming, you know, more and more dangerous over time. And... Also topical, Matt. Mm-hmm. And I've been ass linking with uh, this dude that you just you find him in one like the very first dungeon that you go first or second dungeon that you go into. And he's just a news reporter trying to get a picture without, you know, putting himself in too much danger. Also, I feel that, Matt. I feel mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have friends that we're s with. How how do the s mechanics work? Um, It's actually, like, honestly, very, very much the same way that personas work. Okay, so, Jaren, to, to get to lean more into the persona kind of thing, they divide the day into like four sections, which is basic, uh-huh, which is basically like you know morning when like your predetermined kind of story stuff happens. Uh, it goes into like you know noon where you have the choice on where you want to go, uh, and where you want to go is like kind of like these different um kind of locations. I, I'm like oh they're like their own kind of like world maps overworld maps almost um and inside of these like world maps you are able to kind of like you know do puzzles to find your way to the you know titular dungeons of hinterberg and then you know you can delve into those um they have like predetermined points where you can kind of like you know save and get out or you know you can just keep pushing very very persona y in that way. And you know, once you complete the dungeon, you you know, you get your 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 usual kind of like prizes and the game like, you know, moves to the next story or uh like it moves to like the evening. Or instead of doing a dungeon, you can, you know, just do kind of other like kind of like either like, you know, interacting with people to raise like your your sort of like S link points with them. Or doing stuff that you know raises your your stats, your your like beef bowl challenge equivalents sort of thing. Amazing. Right. But in this case, it's like, oh, I'm gonna go, you know, relax by this pool <laughs> or this uh, this lake. I wish I could get my stats up by just relaxing that. that mm-hmm. That's the dream. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I try to actually do kind of like the stats system in this game, okay. um, because you know, kind of like as expected, your stats tie into your sort of S-Link stuff, so you need, like, certain stats to S-Link with certain people. But one thing I kind of, like, thought was interesting is that your stats um, kind of tie into your equipment as well, where, you know, you can only wear your stat certain equipment if you have certain stats, and once you hit certain breakpoints, certain pieces of equipment that you can wear without, like, you know, specific stat requirements become better, which I think is, like, an interesting twist on the kind of, like, stats mechanic and and kind of the equipment mechanic as well fair all right matt Mm -hmm. so you're dungeon crawling as well have Mm -hmm. to ask how's the actual combat feel jaren the actual combat is like very it's weirdly floaty jaren i think it's like weirdly Mm -hmm. floaty but overall i think the combat is like very very standard for a 3d kind of action game you know it is your standard it actually reminds me um when you get into a battle it like kind of locks you into a small arena kind of like in like like quest 64 you're like stuck in a little like circle Amazing. and you're just kind of like fighting these enemies uh you have access to kind of like weapon skills that you are able to equip you have access to every location like in in the in world lore every location has magic tied to it so when you go to like one location you'll have a like a bomb magic power and like a 
if you go to another location, you'll have like a tornado magic power. And it's an interesting way to kind of like divide magic ups to make it so that you don't, you know, fully rely on a single magic. And it makes it so that since every um, place has its own dungeons, it kind of like varies up the kind of puzzles that you do in the dungeon because that's usually how they're they're like puzzle mechanics work in each dungeon. It's like very much tied to the magic of that current overworld's location. Okay. So Matt, Mm -hmm. seems like there's a bit of everything in this game. Yes. So I have to ask, Mm -hmm. with so much going on, has it been able to, you know, hold your attention? Does it make you want to keep on playing? Jaren, the thing is, it doesn't make me want to keep playing. But I think that's more so not on the game itself. Mm. I think it's more so on like what I was expecting kind of going in. Okay. Because I wasn't expecting so, so much story in this game, Jared. I was honestly kind of like based on the um, preview video, based on, or like the trailer, based on like kind of like the name itself, I guess. I was expecting a lot more of an action-y game. Right. And like I said, like, I think this game is more so is like 20% action and then like 80% everything else. Which mm-hmm. I think that's kind of rough when I think about it, because sometimes when I know it's not necessarily a one to one direct comparison to the Persona games. Mm-hmm. But you know how I play Persona, Matt, where I'll beeline the dungeon first day of the cycle yeah. and then I'll have the rest of the month to S-Link and story stuff where... Mm-hmm. I think that is a detriment to my relationship with the Persona games in some regard, just because, Matt, Mm -hmm. it's, I feel like in theory, Persona works best when you're able to have that 50-50 split, but when you do 100 of one thing and then uh, wait to do 100 of another, it it's really hard to swallow sometimes where sometimes you might be just talking to friends and you feel like, man, I wish I was dungeon exploring right now. So (laughs) Mm -hmm. to hear that this game has a 80% story to 20% split, that also seems rough where I'm guessing in the day, you know, your daily cycle, Mm -hmm. are there just instances where you don't even see combat at all? Um, I haven't run into the, a day like that yet. I, mm-hmm. I've always gone to do combat because, um, like, it's not like Persona where you're kind of, like, locked to one dungeon for a certain amount of time. Okay. You, you can kind of, like, progress to each, like, every day I've done a different dungeon. But, Jen, I, I don't want to say that, like, this is a bad game because I think this is a very good game. I think it's just not the game for me. Fair. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, if you are looking for a um game that is far more puzzle based than it is a combat based i think this is like a good game to go into if you're looking for a game that you know i think like the graphic style of this game doesn't do anything special for me but i do think that it like people are going to find the graphic style of this game interesting because it is kind of like in that cell shaded kind of like almost uh spider versey kind of way because they do have a kind of a lot of um kind of like the the comic textures that was in like the spider verse movies like throughout the game if you want to, you know, do some kind of like S linking stuff, like I think this is like very a very good game. Um I think for me the kind of like weakness of their S linking system is that it is not initially tied to your party. One thing that they actually did that I kind of like from a kind of a power gaming point of view, but it's probably detrimental in terms of like, you know, a social gaming point of view is that they kind of list out all the people that you will be able to S-Link with and what you get from them. Because uh, unlike kind of like the Persona series, where you're kind of S-Linking with them and, you know, you get like stronger Personas or whatnot. Uh, In this game, S-Linking with certain people is more so like, okay, when you level up this S-Link, they will give you like bonus... uh, max mana or bonus like you know max hp or you can like do more damage or you are able to unlock like certain chests after you get to this like certain level so from like that kind of like power gaming point of view it makes it so that it's more so a like value pick instead of like a who do i want to hang out with pick which is kind of a little bit like weird for i think what this game is like trying to get across 
but I don't know. Like Jared, I think this game like does have its own kind of like charm to it that just isn't the charm that is uh, appealing to me. That's fair, Matt. Where mm-hmm. again, this is Dungeons of Hinterburg, mm-hmm. uh, also available on Game Pass, which I think again this lends itself to being a good Game Pass game. Where mm-hmm. when you told me about it, I looked it up. I thought, yeah, aesthetically, I really do like the look of the game, and at least with the with the Game Pass service, I'll be able to try it out. But yeah, I feel like I don't know in the life sim aspect of it mm-hmm. i personally haven't been able to you know connect with a life sim especially recently too and when i was going through game pass i think they put up uh my life at sandrock i believe i forget what uh, uh, Portia yeah, yeah. sequels have been called mm-hmm. and again not necessarily a game for me so i'm really curious to see how if I also gel with Dungeons of Hinterburg, since I did download it, so I'll, I'll try to check it out this week as well. Mm-hmm. But for the but yeah, again, it looks nice at least. And if it sounds like this is your game, the unique blend of you know a life sim, a dungeon crawler, and even the character interactions or the S links, uh, it seems like it could be a hit, Matt. But yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like with a lot of games on Game Pass as of late. It is just a mine over, I think, it's not necessarily a dig at quality. It's more so I'm just not in a kind of right mood for this game, which I mean, I feel like that's just what happens in an era of streaming where, Matt, Mm -hmm. whether it be YouTube, whether it be Netflix, whether it be another service I'm subscribed to, I do find myself starting (laughs) a lot of videos and not being able to finish them just because not not in the right mindset for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But Matt, you mm-hmm. know what I'm in the mindset of? What is it, Jaren? Announcements at San Diego Comic-Con <laughs> 2024. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of big news to come out of Comic-Con specifically this year. But mm-hmm. one thing that is adjacent to the Mistake Zone and Saturday Morning Arcade, Matt, mm-hmm. I'm taking this from Polygon, uh, Mortal Kombat 1, you know, the latest NetherRealm fighting game. Um, they have announced Mortal Kombat 1 Chaos Reigns, which is a kind of story style add-on uh, that will arrive on September 24th, just four days before Uzumaki. Mm-hmm. And the expansion itself will include six new characters um, in terms of Mortal Kombat uh, original characters we have Cyrax, we have Sector, and then we have Noob Cybot. Mm-hmm. And Matt, we have three guest characters. We have uh, Terminator T1000 from Terminator 2, we have Ghostface from Scream, and then we have Conan the Barbarian. And mm-hmm. you know, just going through the bullet points right now from Polygon as well. Uh, Cyrax, Noob Cybot, and Sector will be available when Mortal Kombat 1 Chaos Reigns launches in September. The three remaining guest characters will be released afterwards. No dates announced. Uh, Animalities, a finishing move introduced in Mortal Kombat 3, also returns Mm -hmm. um, with this expansion. And Matt, Mortal Mm -hmm. Kombat 1, the actual story will focus on Havoc, you know, a returning, I believe it's he's a Deadly Alliance character or from the 3D era of Mortal Kombat mm-hmm. and his decision to unleash chaos on the Nether Realm at the end of the original game story. Havoc serves as Chaos Reigns' major threat and seems to be responsible for reviving Sub Zero as Noob Saibot. Mass yes. mm-hmm. Mortal Kombat 1 Chaos Reigns, as I said, comes out September 24th. And interestingly enough, Combat Pack 2 will not be available as a standalone character bundle as Warner Brothers announced uh, in a press release. So, Matt, Mm -hmm. we have uh, new story content and we have six new characters coming to Mortal Kombat 1 and plus animalities in terms of a new finisher type. Mm -hmm. But when you see this roster of new characters, how are you feeling about them, Matt? I really like the returning character, like the returning Mortal Kombat characters. Yes. Because I think like the robots and Noob Saibot were like design wise some of my favorite characters from the Mortal Kombat series. Uh, now, it- with Mortal Kombat 1 being a, you know, imagine or a reimagined timeline of the Mortal Kombat series, so we get, mm-hmm. you know, more or less fresher takes on new characters. Uh, one of the hubbub I've been seeing online discourses, Matt. 
Mm -hmm. You know, we have Cyrox, we have Sector. They don't seem to be cyborgs this time around, but more so uh, Iron Man suit equivalents. Yeah. Does that do anything to you, you know, for better or positive, negatively? I mean, I don't think it really does anything too Mm -hmm. much for me, like like positively or negatively. Uh, One thing I actually don't like, though, Jaren, is that um, kind of the way that they designed... Cyrax's attacks, right? They seem to be a lot more like almost like green foam. Yeah, yeah. From what I remember, before it was a lot more acidic in style, and that that's something I kind of like didn't like when I when I was seeing it. But yeah. like everything else, like seems fine to me. Mm-hmm. Does Ed Boon like foam stars? Jaren, did is foam stars still around? Did that? <laughs> I thought that game died. <laughs> No, we're not going to get into uh, Square Enix right now. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Oh man, but yeah, like as far as the the returning Mortal Kombat characters go, like I'm I'm happy with those. Jaren, the special characters that Mortal Kombat has been getting across their like games is like very <laughs> targeted at the age group of people who played the original Mortal Kombat. I think. Yeah, I totally feel that. Where. I know a lot of people have been saying this lately where I'm still surprised NetherRealm hasn't really attempted. Maybe Warner Brothers just doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But a standalone, hey, here's action movie combat or here's horror movie combat where the, the picks of everything, of all the guest characters that they've seen to get, especially recently Mm -hmm. with the... You know, ever since Mortal Kombat 9, I believe, it is, you know, kind of targeted in a way of, hey, we're leveraging not only the action movie, you know, inspirations that definitely influenced these games um, during their production or their its whole lifetime, but also the horror movie aspect and even the comic book aspect where mm-hmm. between Mortal Kombat and even Injustice in a way as well, the guest characters have been pretty fitting where specifically for, you know, Combat Pack 2, Matt, how are you feeling for another Terminator, uh, Ghostface, and Conan the Barbarian? I think, honestly, the T-1000 was a weird pull to me. Mm -hmm. I understand that it is a kind of like, you know, very well-known character from the Terminator franchise, but I feel like compared to like Ghostface and Conan, it's almost like a tier below. Especially, like, when you, like, also, like, kind of look at all the the characters that were in, like, you know, previous games. Like, I feel like having, you know, legitimate, like, Arnold Terminator in one game and then, like, this one having the T-1000 is a little weird. Then again, I don't know if the T-1000 has, like, come back in future Terminators because I never really kept up with them. Yeah, to be fair, Matt, Mm -hmm. I'm not not really a Terminator guy, so I can't really speak (laughs) Uh to the quality of it, where... I think when I think about the previous characters uh, and, you know, when they were DLC as well, it's one of those things where, I don't know, Matt, I really do wish eventually we get to the point of a Mortal Kombat Ultimate just because it feels weird not being able to, you know, you've introduced or you've had, you know, iconic guest characters in the past, but... The for the most part are just kind of one and done, which mm-hmm. really does make me feel a bit bad. But it, it's understandable that's how guest characters work. But mm-hmm. like how I want there to be a Capcom versus Capcom at some point, uh, I do want them. I would like them to bring back everyone, just because. Yeah, it feels weird when you have Arnold Terminator in likeness one game, but then he's not going to be able to fight, you know, the T-1000 this time around as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, and to be fair, man, I, I wouldn't... I'm okay with the picks of guest characters, but at the same time, I'm not sure who else. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of different characters they can still get, but I don't know. These aren't hitting as big as previous reveals are but at the same time i'm still glad that they're still keeping fresh uh all their guest characters seem to be new to the series in some capacity Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know it's still cool uh but 
does the new story expansion do anything for you as well? I mean, Jaren, I I don't really like pay too close attention to the Mortal Kombat stories. Um, yeah, I I I really do kind of just do the oh, I'm gonna go like skim through the story in uh, someone's like, hey, like Mortal Kombat one full playthrough, <laughs> no yeah. commentary kind of videos. Uh, so I do kind of like going through them like that, Jaren. I'm more so actually. I don't know. I guess like since I never delved too deep into Mortal Kombat like itself in terms of uh, DLCs. I'm very surprised that this game or like the uh, DLC is going to be like forty nine dollars. Yeah, I'm assuming American from the since it's on Polygon, which like seems high to me, but I don't know if that actually is high or not because I don't really know what the standard going rate is for uh, fighting game DLCs. It. I don't know. I feel like fighting game DLCs have been skewed over like the past year. Matt, mm-hmm. surprise, inflation is out to get us all as well. Yeah, yeah. But I'm looking at the Steam page for Mortal Kombat 1 right now, and this is Canadian prices, Matt, uh-huh, uh-huh. where Combat Pack 1 is $40. And I believe that was six characters again as well. Yeah. Where a character seems to be... Ten dollars, like one character is ten dollars. A a cameo character is six dollars Canadian. And looking at Matt, the Chaos Reigns expansion is also here. Uh, the Chaos Reigns expansion is sixty four ninety nine Canadian, and then there's the Chaos Reigns bundle for seventy nine ninety nine Canadian. What is in the bundle? Oh, I believe this also, or the Chaos Reigns bundle for eighty dollars also gives you the season one pass as well. Mm, I see. So again, Matt, I feel like I guess it is standard considering, you know, forty dollars for pass one, and then you have the DLC story stuff. So I don't know, Matt. It's hard to really judge because I'm also looking at Street Fighter Six, the year two character pass. Um, that's $40 for four characters as well. But then you also have like the ultimate pass version for uh, $30 more, and that gets you costumes, alternate colors. So I, I guess it's in line with what it is, $10 give or take for a character mm. uh, plus the story. So I mean, Wait, would it be more like five for a character or something? Oh, I guess, yeah, if it's yeah. six characters. Uh, but if you were to buy them alone, it is they oh, are pricing them yeah ten dollars each. So, Jared, how much was the Smash Fighter Pass? I need to go look this up. <laughs> okay, yeah, Jared, the Smash Fighter passes are like twenty five and like thirty US dollars. Oh man, which I guess is actually a lot higher than I remember them being. Man, I still need to buy character pass too for Smash Brothers. Not that I'm actively oh, playing man. Smash Brothers, but you Jared, know, gotta consume at all times. I bought Fighter Pass too, and then I didn't start up Super Smash Brothers after I bought it. Matt, don't worry. One day you'll, your family will have a fam jam, and you'll dust that bad boy right oh, off. Oh man! In theory, Matt. In theory. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, Matt. Uh, Mortal Kombat One Chaos Reigns expansion um, this September as well, four days before Uzumaki. But Matt. Hmm. Also coming out of Comic Con, I think some of the biggest news came yes. out of the Marvel Studios, the MCU panel, and that. Mm-hmm. Let's just get this out of the way. Robert Downey Jr. will play one of Marvel's most infamous villains, Doctor Doom, where when um, Captain America: Winter Soldier and Avengers: Endgame directors Joe and Anthony Rosso will return uh, to direct. Avengers Doomsday coming out May 2026 and Avengers Secret War uh, May 2027. Matt, Mm -hmm. they pushed the Robert Downey Jr. emergency button. (laughs) uh, And they also pushed the Russo Brothers emergency button as well. Mm -hmm. With all this coming out of Comic-Con, you know, we also got um, the Fantastic Four update, now called Fantastic Four. Uh, first steps set in a retro future version of the 60s coming out July 25th, 2025. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thunderbolts will be May 5th, 2025. And of course, Captain America Brave New World, February 14th, 2025, with some story stuff being revealed for each of them as well. But Matt, mm-hmm. how do you think about the quote unquote Marvel panic buttons being pressed? 
Jared, first of all, I'm very surprised that Doomsday is going to be in 2026. That seems mm. earlier than I would have expected. Yes. I think I, f- I feel like I also remember reading that they like just scrapped a bunch of projects as well, right? Or was I imagining that? No, I guess the Kang stuff is pretty much being swept under the rug moving forward with everything that has happened over the past year. But yeah, uh-huh. with such a major shift, especially the reveal with Robert Downey Jr. as Doctor Doom, May 2026 does seem pretty early for this because you would mm-hmm. assume that this hasn't even started filming yet, I would guess. Yeah, uh, I would guess that as well. And especially with Secret Wars being a year later, Matt, over under, do these films get delayed? I feel like, you know, the fact that they had they pushed the, like, their emergency buttons, I feel like they're not going to be delayed. I think they'll, they'll okay. come out on time. Right. Or, like, at worst, they'll be delayed, like, maybe half a year-ish. Fair. But, Jaren, I'm... I'm I'm interested in seeing like what's gonna happen. I I I, Jared, I hope that for some reason they they find a way to shove Chris Evans into the uh, Fantastic Four movie. Matt. Mm-hmm. So while we're on the topic of you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I also yeah. saw Deadpool and Wolverine this past weekend as well. Mm-hmm. Where I'm not gonna talk about you know, spoilers directly, but just kind of give my general impressions of the movie. And I think I wanted to tie it together with this discussion of the Marvel panic button, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with the announcement of, once again, Robert Downey Jr. returning, playing Dr. Doom. Yeah. Again, having Robert Downey Downey Jr. (laughs) playing two of my favorite Marvel characters in Iron Man and Dr. Doom, Mm -hmm. Matt, as a fan, I'm excited, of course. Uh How can I not be excited? Yeah. Where... Love uh, his portrayal of Tony Stark and can't wait to see what they do with Doctor Doom. And of course, this is most like, given the current state of the MCU, this is a Doom variant, which I'm curious if he'll... I know it's... We've had minor characters be played by the same actor, like different minor characters be played by the same actor in the MCU before Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But... Matt, this is the guy. Like, yeah. This is Mr. MCU. <laughs> uh, before I get into my general thoughts of Deadpool and Wolverine, mm-hmm. do you think Robert Downey Jr. as Dr. Doom is a Victor Von Doom variant, or is this a Tony Stark variant? See, Jared, I honestly have no idea. Because I am very interested in... Honestly, seeing it play out in both ways. Mm-hmm. Because like I think like if he comes back as alternate universe Tony Stark has become Doctor Doom for whatever reason, I think that is like an interesting storyline where if they do, you know, mention him as like Tony Stark himself. I also think it would be very interesting if he is just normal doctor or normal uh yeah normal doctor like non tony stark doctor doom Mm -hmm. and if they do go that way i do also wonder if like you know everybody knows now that robert don jr is playing uh doctor doom so i kind of wonder if they even decide to address that in the movie if it is the kind of like you know non tony stark doctor doom Mm mm-hmm because I would, I think it would be very interesting for him to just never be without the Doctor Doom mask right. throughout the series, and kind of like you know, kind of like the same fair. way that like the V for Vendetta guy is is you know, I I can never remember that guy's name, mm-hmm. but like you know, everybody knew it was him playing him, but he had the mask for the whole movie. But that, mm-hmm. not to be pessimistic, big business. You have to have him un- unmasked, right? For purely marketing purposes. I think the marketing f- purpose of like people knowing that it's him Fair. is already served. I think you don't need to do it in the movie. Oh, I don't. I don't know if <laughs> if you're already unveiling him on stage. I feel like you have to, Matt. I don't know. Yeah, I'm really curious what the execution is, and I think I, I think it's a given with the discourse, right? I that this probably isn't the. Doctor Doom we see in the Fantastic Four movie. 
Uh, and I'm oh, also you think curious. it's not going to be the Doctor Doom from that movie? No, I don't. I don't think that this is the Doctor Doom in mm. the Fantastic Four. If they do decide to go down that route as well, but that's why I'm also curious how Doomsday plays out and how ultimately Secret Wars plays out as well. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. I think when Doctor, sorry, when to, uh, when uh, yeah, Robert when Downey Stark. Jr. Uh-huh. Yeah, when, when Doctor Stark was announced as. Um, Dr. Doom, after that initial, holy shit, what is happening, like, wore off, I I feel like this, in combination with watching Deadpool and Wolverine this weekend, really gives me a weird perspective of the MCU as a whole right now in 2024, in that we've talked about it in the past Marvel fatigue, just general Marvel fatigue, Matt, Mm -hmm. where the last Marvel movie I saw proper was um, The Last Doctor Strange, A Multiverse of Madness. And the last series that I've watched uh, front to back was Loki and Hawkeye, where despite, you know, Ant-Man being one of my top five um, Marvel movies, despite Guardians being top three marvel movies for me i haven't seen the latest guardians i haven't seen um Mm -hmm. the latest ant-man didn't watch the new season of loki just because it's so much man it's so much yeah and it's it's hard for me to get over the fatigue where you had so much riding on deadpool and wolverine um just from a community standpoint of everyone saying this is going to save the mcu and Mm -hmm. matt i enjoyed the deadpool movies in the past you know i respect ryan reynolds's love for you know the deadpool character and what he's done to make this a reality and to see it all you know and then to have hugh jackman there and just to have it all come together in deadpool and wolverine deadpool's official introduction to the mcu and matt Mm mm-hmm I'm of two minds, and they're two weird minds of Deadpool and Wolverine. Okay. The first one being, as a casual fan of the MCU, as someone with, who was there, you know, we watched Iron Man 1 together. We were there since the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw Endgame. And just to see that come full circle, as a casual MCU fan who has fell off due to Marvel fatigue... This is such a fun movie. This is a Deadpool movie through and through. This is a fun popcorn movie. It got me a lot of laughs. It got me popping off at certain bits. Um, Just even the meta jokes, Matt, were really good. And of course, you go to a Deadpool movie to expect it. Where, Matt, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've been friends from for a long time now. And I can honestly say... Knowing you, I think you'll really enjoy this movie. Nice. Now, that being said, Matt. Oh, no. (laughs) As an MCU fan, I loved Deadpool and Wolverine. Okay. As a mid-30s bitter old man, (laughs) Matt. Uh Uh-huh. Deadpool and Wolverine is not a good movie. (laughs) Okay. Like, I'm, I'm not saying this to be you know, overly pessimistic because again, uh-huh. I like this movie, but at the same time, the plot is super thin. Oh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't make sense in a lot of regards. And some of the misdirects that try to, you know, hold the movie together and try to make some surprises. It's nonsense, Matt. Like this is a bad movie, <laughs> but at the same time, uh-huh. It's it's weird, Matt, where without giving too much away, I feel like in between Deadpool and Wolverine and in between Spider-Man No Way Home, the Marvel MCU right now is in this weird spot of it not only trying to incorporate all these different universes, you know, the Sony-verse, the Fox-verse, Mm-hmm. But it also seems to be like trying to really rely on that nostalgia pop. And that's why I find the idea of them pressing the RDJ panic button, the Russo Brothers uh-huh. panic button, so interesting right now. Just because, for better or for worse, Matt, their attempts at trying to establish a new generation of heroes 
at least to casual viewers like me, hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And for them to return to, you know, the tried and true formula in some degree is weird to me overall. Now that I, I, I'm having some distance from that announcement of, you know, the new Avengers and from Deadpool and Wolverine, where Matt, I read mm -hmm. so many discussion threads about Deadpool and Wolverine and of the thousands of comments, I've like literally thousands of comments was because Matt, I couldn't sleep after I saw the movie. <laughs> so I was just reading mm -hmm, comments. Mm -hmm. All of them talked about the cameos. All of them talked about the meta jokes only a handful of them actually discuss the movie as a whole, its placement in the MCU, and, you know, its story. And everything was negative in that regard, Matt. Uh -huh. Where okay. it, it's, it's this weird notion that we need these, so essentially these extended universes to be uh, consolidated and in turn validated in some weird way degree where i feel like everyone is talking about this is how the spider this is how the sony verse this is how the fox verse now fits into the mcu mm -hmm. instead of you know just talking about deadpool and wolverine for what it is but at the same time what deadpool and wolverine is is that nostalgia pop is the fan service it's i don't know matt where it's hard for me to take the MCU seriously in 2024 right now, just because it doesn't seem that serious where I was talking to Rakush and the MCU during that, you know, during the golden run from mm -hmm. Iron Man one to Avengers, it seemed so crafted. It seems, you know, quote unquote, well thought out where everything was planned. And now it, the, their two biggest movies as of late, which was Deadpool and Spider-Man are all just nostalgia pops. And that makes me feel really weird about where the MCU is at mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Where, again, it's... I don't know. It's this weird feeling of they can't establish new heroes because everyone rather, you know, consumes what's been pretty much established already. And th that feels weird to me, Matt. I mean, I and... also think it's that, like, there aren't any like good new characters to establish yeah. movies with right fair enough where matt mm -hmm. and and then again like I, I completely acknowledge the fact that this was also just an oversaturation play where yeah as much as they tried to establish you know miss marvel or the eternals or uh moon knight and while they were all of uh, varying quality i just feel like when you go from the highs of the golden run of the mm -hmm. mcu it's really a heart and nostalgia is such a hell of a thing that yeah where, i don't know it, it's weird that you know you did have moon knight you did have miss marvel you did have the eternals and even though they weren't necessarily high there's still kind of the uh they're still kind of seen as the not great parts of the mcu and on the flip side just because of the nostalgia pops we're now seeing this weird you know i'm not saying the amazing spider-man or like the x-men movies were bad per se but i feel like a lot of people now are looking at them with rose tinted glasses uh and that just seems weird to me matt where what what i'm ultimately trying to say in my ramble is I feel like the MCU brand is too strong right now to the point where you can get away with having paper thin plots as long as you can have, you know, that brand for better or for worst. And oh. that's what, why I'm so conflicted over Deadpool and Wolverine, where if you take it for what it is, a fun fan service movie, it's, it, it's a good time, Matt. But mm -hmm. at the same time, Mixed with all the recent Comic Con announcements, it's just wow, the MCU is in a really weird place right now. And I, I hope it kind of gets better. I hope the quality is there. But at the same time, when I think about uh, Doomsday and especially Secret Wars, Matt, I'm mm -hmm. part of me is dreading Secret Wars because of the fact that so is the expectation you're just going to bring everything 
into it. Will this be the ultimate um, like fan service of are we just going to throw everything into this movie and will that be enough to carry it if that makes sense? Where mm-hmm. with Endgame, it seemed a lot more organic, but given the run we've seen with Spider-Man with Deadpool, I feel like we're we're walking a thin line between something organic and something that's just pure fan service for better or for worse. But that, that, that's, that's my <laughs> rant of Deadpool and Wolverine. Good. Mm-hmm. It's a good movie, but it's not actually a good movie, if that makes sense. But I do recommend it for you, Matt. And I want to know your opinion on all the cameos because Matt, they're, they're pretty fun okay, as well. Okay. But Matt, I, I went on a long tangent that I'm pretty sure doesn't make sense. But Matt, <laughs> Uh-huh. Friends of the show know that every time I go on a long tangent, it, it it's barely coherent. So, uh, you know what is coherent, though? Hopefully. <laughs> what is it, Jared? That hmm. don't match me challenge for this week. Oh, man. And I'm the one who brings the challenge this week. And even though I went on a weird MCU rant, it's not going to be an MCU related don't challenge or don't match me challenge this week, Matt. Okay. Saving that in the chamber. But... Mm-hmm. Since we did talk about Mortal Kombat earlier, mm-hmm. Matt had to go, you know, the sequel to your fighting game, uh, Don't Match Me Challenge last week, but have to be a bit more specific. And Matt, this is my Mortal Kombat Don't Match Me Challenge Okay. Uh, this week. And Matt, mm-hmm. first question right off the bat, pretty easy peasy. Again, the rules is I'm going to tell you five categories each progressively getting a bit more specific and all you have to do is is to come up with an answer that doesn't match mine Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. first question uh pretty obvious but name any mortal kombat character oh no so so many characters matt (laughs) so many in this franchise all you have to do is just name any mortal kombat name any character that has appeared in a mortal kombat game Mm -hmm. uh so in five Four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you said meat, oh, out. I forgot about that character, Jared. I uh, I went with my my good old noob Cybot. Nice, Matt. Mm-hmm. Speak about noob Cybot. My mm-hmm. next one, getting a bit more specific, but we're still going to be on the character train, Matt. Okay. Mm-hmm. For round two, name any Mortal Kombat ninja. Ooh. So just any ninja. Uh, whether it be Matt, mm-hmm. for those who know, if you know, you know, this can be of the Sub Zero Scorpion line, or this could be of the Katana Molina line. So just any Mortal Kombat ninja mm. in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you said Rain, you're out. Ooh. Jaren, I actually don't remember if this is a right answer or not. Was Ermac a ninja at some point? Matt, I consider Ermac a ninja because in my heart, Ermac will always be Red Scorpion. Okay, okay, good. I couldn't remember if I was imagining that or not. Matt, mm-hmm. as long as it's a palette swap, uh-huh. you're fine, you're fine. Uh-huh. In, in, in our challenge books, in our mm-hmm. challenge books. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm-hmm. round three, still on the character train, but a bit more specific. We uh-huh. mentioned it in uh, combat. You know, what... Mortal Kombat has also been known for of recent iterations is its guest characters. So Matt, yes, name any Mortal Kombat guest character. Oh, any character that's not originally from Mortal Kombat, but ha- that has partook in Mortal Kombat. Mm-hmm. In five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you said. 2011's Mortal Kombat's Kratos, who appeared in the PlayStation oh. 3 and PlayStation Vita versions. You're out. Jared did not even know he was in the game because I yep. went with Robocop. Nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Now, Matt, mm-hmm. uh, part of the announcement of um, the K- the new expansion for Mortal Kombat 1, Matt, mm-hmm. animalities are returning. Ooh, so, yes. in that vein, name any Mortal Kombat finisher. Like a specific finisher or like a finisher so type? So in terms of... So essentially, any Ality. Okay, okay, okay. Shoot, this might have gave... 
Matt, this might have gave away my answer, but <laughs> name any Mortal Kombat finisher or ality mm-hmm. in five, four, three, two, one. Matt? Mm-hmm. Of course, it's the basis of the Mistake Zone. It's the basis of Saturday Morning Arcade. I said friendships. Ooh, Jaren, I said babality. Babality? Babyality? Yep. Babyality. Yeah. <laughs> pretty close. Pretty close, uh-huh. Matt. Uh-huh. Jared, because we're still big babies here on the Mistake <laughs> Zone. <laughs> We're still big babies, and we're still friends, hopefully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Matt, Mm -hmm. finally, Mm -hmm. one of the things that also Mortal Kombat, to me, is known for is the various mini-games that have found their way uh, through the various iterations of Mortal Kombat. So, for the final round of my Mortal Kombat Don't Mash Me Challenge, Mm -hmm. just name any Mortal Kombat mini-game this could include Ooh. one of the, you know, test your games as well. So name any Mortal Kombat minigame in five, four, three, two, one. Matt mm-hmm. had to go with Motor Combat, the kart racing minigame. Oh, Jaren, I could only remember the one where you have to, like, break the stone to test your might. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nice. That seems mm-hmm. like you survived the oh, Jared Mortal Kombat Don't Match Me Challenge for this week. I made it. Well, hopefully all our friends survived as well. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. Um, you know what? Mm. Don't match me bonus question when I was still putting all of these together. Okay. Matt uh-huh. and friends, mm-hmm. name any Junji Ito work, whether it be a story, an anthology, a chapter name, just what name anything from Junji Ito. Before... Anything from Junji Ito. Yep. Okay. Uh, Matt, th- th- this was my round one question before I realized. Oh, I should just make everything Mortal Kombat themed. Oh man, go for go. So Matt, but bonus don't match me challenge mm-hmm. in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you or a friend said uh, Ramina, aka Hellstar Ramina, you're out. Oh. Jaren just went with Amigara Fall, the classic. The classic. Classic anime. I hope that gets, like, something animated for it. I'm. It doesn't have an I'm, animation, right? Like, I don't... It wasn't in, like, I'm, any of the anthologies or anything, was it? It might have been, but t- mm. to be honest, man, I fell off all the anthologies <laughs> <laughs> pretty early on. So if oh. it was there, um, I, I, I just didn't watch it. But... Mm-hmm. Matt, I'm also what You know what I'm watching? That's a Jaren's. Because I like skateboarding and I like brick dancing. Oh, Matt, have you been Jaren, watching? I cannot wait until breaking is uh like done in the Olympics because I'm very interested in seeing how it's going to be done. Yeah, I didn't watch it live, so but I have the skate men's skateboarding finals. Uh, mm. You know, just paused right now. I was watching it before we recorded, but yeah, I'm really excited about break, Matt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> When breaking happens at the Olympics and we watch it, uh-huh. are we gonna have a breaking episode of uh, the Mistake Zone? Jaren, after that, like ev- those events happen, there is a zero percent chance we are not gonna talk about it on the Mistake Zone. Because fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. I am just so interested in seeing how the outcome of those dances is gonna look, mm-hmm. because the rubric for like what is being scored in breaking makes it like seem is like very interesting to me in terms of like how it's going to work not we have an episode in the near future and i'm <laughs> oddly excited right now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but until then matt another beefy episode so i have to thank you as always for joining me and of course editing this podcast sometimes with a broken mouse <laughs> oh, man. jaren thanks i of course want to thank you for as always hosting this show and bringing us our Mortal Kombat, Don't Match Me Challenge, and Jaren, I, you know, gotta gotta go way, way back, and Jaren, I think I I should also thank you for for bringing me into the, uh, I think the MCU, because I think I wouldn't have watched uh, Iron Man if you didn't want to go see it. (laughs) Hey, thanks, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt, Mm -hmm. I'm looking actually at the guest list of the Mortal Kombat guest characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, all dudes. Matt, if there was a dudette, I, I'm tr- maybe we, we can sit on this, but who who do you think would be the first uh, female uh, Mortal Kombat guest character? 
now I, mean, I now I gotta go back the, and think about it. The first one I that like shows up in my head is like Ripley. From, Fair because aliens in it already, right? Yeah, alien. Uh, yeah. yeah, the xenomorphs in it mm-hmm. from before. Oh yeah, I, I could see that. Mm-hmm. I, not. I wonder uh-huh. who would sign off their likeness though. Mm. Well. Jared, I know is, Megan is Zena Fo- like canceled. I know, I know Hercules is actor isn't in a good place, but I I don't know what's going on with Zena. <laughs> uh maybe maybe something to look into, Matt. Maybe something to look into. Actually, I guess you can put one of the DC characters too. Oh uh, yeah, but I, I was thinking more so action mm-hmm, movie mm-hmm. adjacent. But we we can save that uh, discussion for another time. But Matt. I mm-hmm. want to thank you. Said that before. I want to thank uh, Melina. I want to thank um, Hinterberg, I guess. Mm-hmm. That, that, that was the game. Right? Oscar, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dungeons thank of Hinterberg. Right? Yep. I want to thank uh, Uzumaki. I want to thank uh, Robert Downey Jr. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to thank Cameos. I want to mm-hmm. thank Fan Service and Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, check out Deadpool and Wolverine. I think you'll, you'd like it. Okay. And I. I think you're not a stickler in the mud like me, so <laughs> you have more reason to like it. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. until then, Matt, please take it away. This has been the Mistake Zone, and we're all out of Nagatoro bullying us. Ah, I want to thank Nagatoro as well, and Senpai, and their friends. 